Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. And here we are Friday, and Fridays on Morning Musings, uh, I label as responding to the critics. We just finished a review uh, of the book, The Future of Rome, uh, which was recommended to me by Derek Lambert, who claimed that the book would answer every claim that I would want to make about Jerusalem being Babylon in the book of Revelation. Well, I believe I've demonstrated that that's not true at all. The, the one chapter that really addresses the identity of Babylon was written by a scholar by the name of Peter Oakes. Uh, please go back and be sure to watch some of those videos in which I believe that I properly, thoroughly, dismantled Mr. Oakes's entire chapter. So, as promised, I want to turn now to an article that was actually written back in 2015. And at the time it was written, the author and I, the author, Andrew Perriman, and I began to have a discussion, a written discussion on the internet. I enjoyed that discussion tremendously. And let me say this, I really, really enjoy Andrew Perriman's writings. I, I believe he's an excellent scholar in many ways. Doesn't mean I agree with him on everything. Certainly not on his identification of Babylon as Rome. Uh, but I would suggest that you read, that you get a copy of his book, The Coming of the Son of Man. Uh, tremendous insights into that book. Now, at the same time, I believe he makes some glaring omissions and some oversights in the book, and yet it's still a book well, well worth reading, all right? So with that said, back in, in 2015, uh, Andrew Perriman wrote this article, and it was push, published on the, uh, on the internet, entitled, 20 Reasons for Thinking that Babylon the Great is Rome, Not Jerusalem. And, that, and again, that was November 2015. And so I want to read to you from page two. Uh, I, believe the, I believe his entire post was something like 69 pages long, if memory serves me correctly. And he makes some very interesting, and I think revealing, comments as the introduction to his article. On page two, he says, quote, Not many people would agree with me, however, that as the followers of Jesus took their message out into the Greek-Roman world, divine judgment on Rome and the confession of Jesus as Lord by the nations of the empire came into view as a second eschatological horizon. So he, he tells us later on, on that same page, the identification of Babylon the Great with Jerusalem is not entirely implausible, but I think it's very unlikely and given both now watch this. You've got to catch the power of this. And given both the Jewish background and the historical circumstances of the early churches in the Greek-Roman world, it would have been remarkable if the fate of Rome had not been a matter of interest to such apocalyptically-minded apostles as Paul and John the seer. That's an incredible statement. And I think more than revealing. But notice, first of all, that he says, not many people would agree with me that the followers of Jesus took the message out into the Greek-Roman world. They talked about divine judgment on Rome. Well, I'm not sure that I would agree with that assessment because when it comes to the book of Revelation, I would say that probably, plausibly, the majority of commentators believe that John was in fact talking about the coming destruction and judgment of Rome. The minority view is clearly that John was talking about Babylon as Jerusalem. That is the minority view. And so it's a little bit perplexing when Mr. Perriman says not many people would agree with me that the followers of Jesus talked about divine judgment of Rome coming very soon. But he does say, among those who would disagree are the friendly preterists who stop by here from time to time. Okay, 
so his entire argument, and, and let me uh, let me go back to one of the paragraphs. Revelation is obviously a difficult text to interpret. I offer some direct exegetical observations regarding the identity of the city, which is called Babylon, but the main point I want to make here is that the Old Testament, extra-biblical Jewish literature, and Paul in particular in the New Testament, all lead us to expect that the God of Israel will first judge his own people, that would be Israel in Paraman's view, then will judge the enemy of, of his people and establish his own rule over the nations. Now, on a surface reading of that paragraph, you would have to say, well, that's true. But a, a cursory reading of the paragraph is not sufficient. So I will simply put that on the table and we will explore it as we go along. But his point number one, and by the way, in his first, uh, I would say, eight points, I, I will pause to consider number eight a little more in depth, but nonetheless, at least his very first seven points can be stated like this. There is a consistent pattern in the Old Testament of judgment on Israel followed by judgment on the overbearing nation by which Israel was judged. Habakkuk is a good example. How will God judge injustice in, in Israel? He will send the Chaldeans. He has ordained them for judgment. But the Chaldeans are worse than Israel. How is that fair? So he proceeds to say that God then predicted that he would deal with the Chaldeans. And then, point number two, it is an integral part of Daniel's son of man vision that the powerful kingdom that oppressed Israel would be judged and destroyed. Daniel chapter 7, verse 11, with dominion being given instead to the people of the saints of the Most High. And then he's point number three. The conviction is repeatedly expressed in Jewish apocalyptic literature that Yahweh would soon judge, point number one, unrighteous Israel, deliver the righteous, and destroy the foreign aggressor, first Greece and later Rome. <clears throat> Pardon me. In the late first century text, fourth Ezra, Rome depicted as an eagle, a fourth beast is accused of having terrorized the world. <coughs> Pardon me. The world. You have judged the earth, but not with truth. This insolent behavior has come up before the Most High, and judgment is pronounced. Point number four. The Qumran sectarians fervently believed that the Ketim, i.e. Rome, would be destroyed and that they themselves would have dominion in a radically changed post-Roman world. Number five, Jesus said that when the Son of Man came, he would sit on his glorious throne, judge the nations according to how they had treated his disciples. The function of the passage may be more rhetorical than strictly revelatory, but it, is at least, it at least shows that the nations were in the field of vision, even for Jesus. It was not all about, not all about Israel. Oh, I got to stop right there. Uh, there. There's more than enough for this video and a whole bunch more. Okay. His very first point to reiterate is there is a consistent pattern in the Old Testament of judgment on Israel followed by judgment on the overbearing nations. Well, here's something that Mr. Perriman seems to overlook. Now, I want you to pay very, very careful attention to me. You absolutely must catch the power of what I'm about to share with you. What I'm about to share with you is not a preterist invention. It is not a preterist um, how do I ex best express this? Is, uh, express this? Well, I guess I'll just express it again. It's not a preterist invention. Okay. So what am I? What am I trying to say? A multitude of modern scholars, world class, non preterist scholars. R. T. France, N. T. Wright. Scott McKnight are three that come to mind immediately. 
Each of these scholars and many, many, many more of them say something along the following lines. In the Old Testament, Israel was promised that her oppressors, didn't matter if it was Assyria, didn't matter if it was Babylon, didn't matter if it was Persia. Israel was promised that her oppressor would be judged, and by the way, her oppressors were judged. Assyria fell, Babylon fell, Persia fell, Greece fell. Okay, no problem whatsoever. So Paraman is saying, so when we come to the book of Revelation, for instance, or when we come to the writings of Paul, what we find there is, okay, the oppressor of God's people, i.e. Rome, Paul says it, supposedly. Revelation says it, supposedly. The oppressor of God's people was going to be judged. Here is what Mr. Perriman overlooks in the scholars that I just cited. France, <clears throat> pardon me, Wright, McKnight, all make the following observations. While it's true in the Old Testament that the pagan nations that were oppressing Israel, God promised to destroy them, when we come to the New Testament, Jesus begins to identify Israel as the enemy, as the oppressor of God's people. Do you catch that? Listen to me carefully. Jesus never once identified Rome as the oppressor of his people. Not once. Now, what these scholars that I'm citing are saying is that Jesus reconstructed the Old Testament story. Israel is the, quote, good guys. They're the elect. They're the, quote, righteous, unquote, even though they may have been horribly unrighteous, but they're still God's people. That's what Habakkuk teaches. When God promised to bring judgment on Israel, specifically Judah and Benjamin, at the hands of the Babylonians, Habakkuk protested and said, O oh Lord, you are too holy that your ears should even hear that which is unrighteous. You are too holy to even think about that which is unholy. How then can you use a nation, of course I'm paraphrasing, how then can you use a nation which is far more ungodly than we are to judge us? Habakkuk was deeply troubled. And the Lord told Habakkuk, Habakkuk, listen, I've got this. Let me take care of this. Yes, it's true that Babylon is horrible. They're going to lead you away with hooks. And by the way, that's what happened. They would take these large metal hooks and they would put them through the flesh on the back of their captives or it through the flesh in the chest and have long chains of captives hooked together by hooks. Ha! Ugh, horrible. So anyway... God said, yes, Babylon is going to lead you away with hooks. But Habakkuk, go and stand on your watchtower. Just stand back and watch and wait. Be patient because vindication is coming. It will come. It will not tarry. It will come at the appointed time and will not delay. In other words, the appointed time for Babylon's judgment had been set, and that appointed time was not would not be delayed. So, yes, Habakkuk was being told <clears throat> that Judah and Jerusalem and Benjamin, they were going to be destroyed by the Babylonians, and yes, God said the Babylonians are going to fall because they are more unholy than you. That's the principle that Andrew Perriman is building upon. But again, this growing number of scholars is recognizing over and over and over again that in the New Testament, it's not Old Covenant Israel that is being depicted as the, 
as the victim of the coming judgment. No, no, no. Old Covenant Israel is being depicted as, number one, the enemy of God. Now look, this has precedent in the Old Testament. In the book of Micah, in the book of Lamentations, in the book of Jeremiah. I'm not going to take the time, I'm already 15 minutes in. I'm not going to take the time to chronicle and to quote so many of those passages. But in the Old Testament, when Israel apostatized, when Jerusalem apostatized, she became the enemy of God, and God stood as her enemy with a sword in his hand. The book of Lamentations is really powerful on this because Jerusalem had become the enemy of God. So what happened? Jerusalem, and by the way, even John MacArthur takes note of this. Noted dispensationalist. John MacArthur says that in their rebellion, in their disobedience, in their rejection of Jesus, Israel became, in Jesus' day, the pagan enemy of God. They became the equivalent of the pagan enemy of God. I don't, I don't nobody would accuse John MacArthur of being a preterist. But do you catch the power of the point? Perriman is arguing, okay, in, is, in the Old Testament, Israel is the innocent victim. She, she is the righteous. She is the elect, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The pagan nations that punish her, that take her into captivity, they will be judged. And that's absolutely true. What he is overlooking is that in the New Testament, pagan Rome is not the focus. Israel in her persecution of the saints, the new covenant seed of Abraham, they are the enemy. In Philippians chapter 3, 16 to 18, Paul, in dealing with the Judaizers, forcing Gentiles to obey the law of Moses to be saved, Paul said, there are some whose God is their belly, and of whom I speak, I tell you now, even weeping, they are are the enemies of the cross. Who is it? The Jews. It's not Rome. It's the Jews. In Galatians chapter 4, 22 and following, Paul said, I want to speak to those who know the law. And Paul says, basically, I want to tell you an allegory. In the law it is written, Abraham had two wives. Abraham had two sons. In this allegory that Paul tells, Ishmael and Hagar represent the old covenant and the old covenant people. Isaac and Sarah represent the new covenant and the new covenant people, the seed of promise. And so what does Paul say? Paul said, <clears throat> as it was then in the days of Ishmael and Hagar, Isaac and Sarah, as it was then, even so it is now, the children of the flesh, the children of the bondwoman persecuted the children of the promise. Old covenant Israel was persecuting the new covenant Israel. Therefore, what says the scripture, Paul says? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for they shall not be heirs of the children of promise. Why? They became the enemy of Christ. Cast her out. What was to be done? cast her out. She was going to be destroyed. She is playing the part of the pagan nation in persecuting the children of God. Consider Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, 21 and following, Peter calls his audience's attention to the fact Moses spoke 
And Moses said, the time is going to come in which God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. To him you shall give heed, and it shall come to pass that any soul that does not obey the voice of that prophet, now watch this, this is incredibly powerful, shall be cut off out from among the people, the people. Now the Greek of the passage is extremely, extremely powerful. Anyone, Peter says, speaking to that Jewish audience, if you will not heed the voice of this prophet, who is Jesus, they shall be utterly, pardon me, utterly cut off. Now that terminology in the, in the Old Testament, utterly cut off meant destruction. It meant termination of any relationship, certainly termination of any covenant relationship. Gads, it's powerful. <laughs> Shall be utterly cut off. Then he says, out from among. So they were among the people, but their refusal to accept Jesus as Messiah and as the prophet promised by Moses would result in their being utterly cut off out from among the people. What does that mean? It means not only is destruction coming, it means they would be exorcised out from among the people, meaning they would no longer be the people. Well, if they're not the people, who are they? Pagans, outsiders. You see the power? Finally, this morning, I want you to consider, and look, there, there are a ton of passages in the New Testament that show us that the enemy of God, all right, the enemy of God was old covenant Israel. I have to say just a word here. Paul in Romans chapter two speaks of the impending judgment of old, of old covenant Israel and of everyone. Some people try to make a huge, huge, huge deal out of the fact that Paul in Romans chapter two, he talks about both Jew and Gentile. There's no big deal to be made. Gentiles joined with Israel in persecuting the church. They were destroyed together. Don't have time to develop that. But here's the point. In the New Testament, over and over and over again, we have the depiction of Israel, old covenant Israel, in persecuting the church, being depicted as the enemy of God, as the pagan enemy of God. One of the most classic examples to be, is to be found in Revelation chapter 3, 9 to 14. Writing to the church at Philadelphia, Jesus says, I know your works, your faithfulness. You've not departed. He commends them highly. And he says, I know that you dwell where the synagogue of Satan is. Though, now watch this. Those who say they are Jews, but they are not because they are liars. Now, here's what you got to catch. I will make them come and bow down before you and to know that I have loved you. Okay, what is, what, wait, 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 wait. what's he doing here? He's saying that the Jews are now the synagogue of Satan, which means they're what? The enemy of God. They're persecuting the true seed. They're persecuting the chosen seed, the new covenant seed. And the Lord says, I will make them, those of the synagogue of Satan, come down and bow before you and to know that I have loved you. You see, the power of this is found in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 14, because Revelation chapter 3 is a direct quote 
from Isaiah chapter 60. But this is where the New Testament writers reconstruct the Old Testament story. They redefine it, if you please. In many, many cases, not in all, but in many, many cases. How so? Well, in Isaiah chapter 60, it is old covenant Israel that is being oppressed by their pagan nations. But God said he was going to turn the tables. And speaking of those pagan enemies, Yahweh said, I will make them, the pagans, come and bow down before you and to know that I have loved you. Oh, that's pagans bowing down before Israel. Oh, covenant Israel. But in Revelation, Jesus is identifying his body, the church, as the chosen people. And he is identifying the Jews of the synagogue of Satan as the pagan enemy. And as the pagan enemy, what was going to happen to them? Well, this city called Babylon, i.e. a pagan city, is, quote, where the Lord was crucified. Babylon, i.e. the city where the Lord was crucified, was a pagan city. That means that Jerusalem was being identified as a pagan city that was about to be destroyed. It was not Old Covenant Israel that was about to be judged as Babylon. I should take that back, shouldn't I? It was Babylon as Old Covenant Israel that was soon to be destroyed, and it was the New Covenant Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem, that was to be vindicated by the destruction of the pagan Babylon, i.e. Old Covenant Jerusalem. I don't know why I said what I did. <laughs> no, it was not a Freudian slip. So my whole point here, ladies and gentlemen, is that Andrew Perriman takes the Old, the Old Testament narrative, which was true at the time, and he converts it into the New Covenant narrative, ignoring the fact that it was Old Covenant Israel that had become the pagan enemy and was the enemy of the cross, enemy of the church, and was thus the pagan enemy, Babylon, that was to be destroyed. Not wrong. I'm completely out of time. You know, sorry that Mike and I couldn't be with you last week. We both had th things that come up, uh, that came up, and so apologize for that. But hopefully, hopefully tonight we'll be back with you with Preterist Apologetics and our ongoing study of Deuteronomy 32 as the key to New Testament eschatology. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you later.